welcome everybody to our June town hall. Um, if it isn't apparent, we're all uh, traveling for snowflakes. So we're com coming live from Vegas uh, and hopefully our internet connection is gonna be stable enough to make this, uh, to make it through. All right, so um, we're gonna do our kind of like regular rundown of community updates, um, project updates. We have Raj joining us from the Optum team to kind of walk us through a contribution that they've been working on. We'll do kind of a deep dive into all the ways you can manage call mobile lineage. Um, we have Herschel bringing us some kind of uh, our sneak peek of SQL parsing and um, Indy will give us a, a look into how you can start tuning some of your search performance. So um, to date, and actually I didn't check this morning, we might be closer, but we are a few clicks away from having 8,000 people in our community, which is just insane to me. Um, I still remember when there were 70 people in the community, it blows my mind that we continue to have so many people uh, coming in and joining us for the conversation. Um, we're seeing just around 1,300 weekly active users in Slack, 7,300 messages posted, 731 emojis. I'm always biased. I would like, to, I'm, I'm emoji, uh, a very emoji positive person. <laughs> so probably the majority of those are coming from me. Um, but yeah, like as always, the Slack community is just buzzing with activity. We love to see it. Um, the other thing that we like to do is to take a look at our uh, community support volume. <clears throat> and so what we're seeing over the past month is around 40 uh, PRs opened on a weekly basis. Um, it's a little bit of a dip bet uh, before, or sorry, based on the period before, but so we're just seeing an amazing throughput of contributions coming in. Um, and we'll dig into the actual contributions uh, summary in just a minute. Um, in terms of our support load and, or sorry, uh, support volume in Slack, um, we're still seeing uh, right around seven, or sorry, 600 uh, messages per week um, in our support channel. This is where I like to call out, if you're able to, if you if you can jump in and help one another out, it gives the kind of core data hub team, um, it gives just gives us a ton of support, then that way we can focus on shipping uh, really impactful features and also you know reviewing all the PRs that are coming through. Um, and speaking of community support, uh, we like to take some time to shout out folks who are jumping in to help one another out. Um, XL, Steve, and Tim continue to just be our, our top uh, supporters, but we have just a ton of people who are jumping in to kind of lend their direction, lend their expertise. We genuine, genu genuinely appreciate uh, what you folks are doing for the community. Um, I do want to jump in. Uh, I, I posted a video about this, la uh, couple, I think maybe two weeks ago in Slack. Um, last month, we sent out a, a survey to kind of get a sense of how things are going within the Data Hub community. Um, so the full video is available on our YouTube, but I wanted to just give, <clears throat> excuse me, just kind of a quick run through of the responses there. Um, and so before we do that, uh, just kind of a snapshot of kind of the volume of, um, of our community or kind of the breadth of our community. We have uh, uh, 8,000 people in our Slack, just under uh, 2,000 organizations in our Slack. So the breadth of of kind of the re or the reach of our Slack community is just tremendous. It seriously, I, I know I just said this, but it blows my mind. Um, we have 390 contributors to our open source project to date, with just under 8,000 GitHub stars. And then on the actual deployment side of things, we see uh, 2,000 quick start quick start users per month, and our best estimate is that Data Hub is deployed in 1,000 right around 1,000 uh, servers across the world. So just from like an adoption and engagement standpoint, uh, there's a lot going on, right? So we sent out the survey, um, sent out the survey in Slack via an app called Poly, um, and uh, I need to step up a little bit. So we heard from um, 74 respondents, and this is just like I said, I'm going to go through this very quickly, um, but. Uh, yeah, here, sorry, I just saw a notification that my connection is unstable. So if if that if you guys aren't hearing me, please let me know uh, in Zoom chat. Um, so, okay, in terms of satisfaction in uh, in the Data Hub community, um, we see that you know well over seventy five uh, percent of respondents uh, said that they were like satisfied, um, which is amazing. It's fantastic. I think where where we as a community are doing well is that there's still just like a very helpful and supportive and kind 
um, kind of a, a feel within the community, which is just fantastic. Um, got a lot of really great feedback about our, our documentation and tutorials and the contribution experience has been has been a positive one for folks. Um, where we definitely need to improve or you know, kind of opportunities for us to kind of innovate or uh, iterate on how we are building the community is making sure that we are keeping up with the support volume that's coming in um, and then looking into kind of some improvements on our deployment experience. Um, in terms of our doc site, we saw, again, right around 75% of folks were satisfied with it, um, if not very satisfied. Uh, the, documentation pro uh, the documentation provides more than enough support for uh, the basic deployment and kind of getting, getting things up and running with an MVP. Um, but one area that I want us to dig into is how we can start to support version documentation. So you kind of, uh, you know, regardless of what version you're on a data hub, you have kind of the most up-to-date docs to go along with that. Um, in terms of satis uh, satisfaction with support provided by others, um, you know, still like very highly satisfied. Um, but this is where I think, uh, you know, we, we need to find ways to encourage people to help one another out. Um, and also just kind of like find common themes that are popping up and, uh, and kind of like incentivize or build, build structures or, uh, in ways that, that folks can kind of answer those, those frequently asked questions and just kind of streamline some of that support. Um, in terms of the responsiveness of the ACL data team, um, this is where I think you know the ACL team. We've been we're we're stretched pretty thin, if I'm being honest. We have a lot going on, and so I think we definitely have some um, introspection that we need to do to figure out how we can be uh, just available and more responsive. Um, but you know, I think the the common theme on where we're doing well is that you know we're always eager to jump in with that more technical or more nuanced support or um, you know. Yeah, giving giving kind of like precise direction, but we need to make sure that we are consistently available to folks and folks know how to, to get in touch with us. Um, in terms of fostering uh, or sorry, how the community fosters collaboration and knowledge sharing, we're doing a great job there. Um, again, you know, 75% of folks have, or a little bit more than 75% of folks said that they were doing that well or very well. Um, and then we had, you know, we had a ton of people say that they would uh, recommend the Data Hub community to others. So um, I know I'm zooming through this really quickly. Um, one thing I want to call out is that based off, you know, I mean, I mean this very sincerely. When we ask for this this feedback, it does inform our near term uh, strategy. So um, we are going to be rolling out our Data Hub Community Council with a focus on documentation and tutorials, um, also really focusing on community love support. Um, we're also going to be talking or trying to find ways where we can have more kind of like topical or topic based forums um, or webinars. So, you know, we can kind of go beyond the basic troubleshooting of it all. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, please feel free to reach out to me. And then on uh, the ACRL side of things, um, just a reminder that we are hiring for a community manager and two uh, data hub community engineers. So we really want to uh, start taking some meaningful um, or we want to have some meaningful progress towards the feedback that we've gotten and so we're actively hiring and building out our team so likewise if you're if you're interested or know anybody that you know might be interested please do reach out and let me know uh all right shashanka i'm going to hand it over to you um oh actually sorry i'm going to uh review our contributions so in june we had 193 prs so we are still consistently in this like 170 to 200 or more contributions. Um, we had 10 first time contributors, which is just outstanding to me and 26 uh, repeat contributors. So huge shout out to everybody who stepped up and, and contributed back to the project. We really, really appreciate you. Shashanka, I will hand it over to you for uh, to talk us through our uh, what's, what's happening in these releases. Cool, so this is, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've uh, gotten a bit more predictable with our releases. We are trying to hit uh, uh, every two weeks schedule. And so these project updates uh, uh, essentially are related to two releases, one that happened and one that's just about to drop, I think later today or tomorrow. So we uh, 0 0.10.4 is already out and 0 0.10.5 is almost out. And so within that, we have obviously the usual uh, features around user experience, uh, improvements around developer experience and then improvements around uh, integrations. So first of all, uh, user experience, we now have the ability to create and assign custom ownership types within Data Hub. So that's pretty cool. You can now go beyond the out of the box types that exist uh, and come up with your own 
uh, roles or ownership types that you'd like to assign to entities and have them show up in on the page. A uh, small but very impactful feature is that we now display the owner type on an entity page. Uh, I was just reflecting on the fact that yesterday when I was doing a demo at the Snowflake Summit booth, someone said, oh, business user and technical user, that's cool, you have them separated out. Uh, and you know, uh, for the last two years, we had it as a hover. And it's so interesting that just that small difference that we did uh, is making people realize that we understand the different kinds of uh, ownership. Uh, moving on, there have been various bug fixes to column level uh, lineage visualization. And one thing that's coming in 0.10.5 that I'm really excited about is you'll finally be able to visualize column level lineage through a data job node. So, you know, when you have a data set and then a data job and then another data set on the other side of that rela lineage relationship, and if you've got a column that's flowing through that particular edge, you're now going to be able to uh, visualize that uh, lineage nicely. Uh, other small things that have uh, made the experience better, unified search and browse is landing finally. So uh, I think it's coming out in 0 0.10.5. So you'll finally be able to get that uh, beautiful uh, unified search and browse experience. Uh, small details, row count values are going to be more human readable and uh, uh, other things like uh, preventing duplicate glossary term names within a group. Really excited about all of these different features that are landing. Moving on to developer experience, a uh, lot of small details. Uh, CSV and Richer is getting better. Uh, there's better guides for changing the default credentials that we come out of the box with. Um, and Elasticsearch and REST endpoints to uh, interact with time series indexes better. And some initial support for routing exceptions to Sentry. So, you know, the actual SAS product, for example, uh, you know, we use Sentry heavily as a way to understand where exceptions might be happening, uh, to understand where uh, problems might exist in, in the platform. And we're going to be contributing that back to the open source project as well. Uh, support for routing exceptions. Perfect. Let's move on to the next section. So integrations, of course, an evergreen area where improvements continue to happen. We have extended our file-based lineage source to now be able to define column-level lineage. So, you know, earlier you would only be able to define data set to data set lineage, but now you can also include column-level lineage in there. And then across the different sources, we have lots of interesting improvements. Uh, on Looker, you can finally now ingest looks that are not part of a dashboard. So standalone looks will now show up in Data Hub. Um, improvements to Glue error reporting, BigQuery, you know, uh, big improvements in uh, ingestion of logs, uh, and Unity Catalog, which Andrew is going to go through in quite a bit of detail. Uh, you're now able to set external URLs, so you can click on, you know, these entities and go straight into uh, their entity pages in Unity Catalog. Um, and then big uh, big thing for Snowflake, I think we finally will have lineage support for S3 and Snowpipe. So, you know, when you set up your Snow, Snowpipe ingestion, uh, you'll be able to then see uh, lineage across those edges as well. And finally, uh, for Power BI, similar to looks uh, that are not part of a dashboard being ingested for Power BI, uh, where there's a concept of data sets. Uh, sometimes you might not be using that data set in a visualization. We previously would not ingest that in, but now you have a configuration flag that allows you to uh, ingest that data set in. And a 0 0.10.5 is releasing this week, so you should be able to get pretty much all of the things I covered uh, fresh and early on Monday. All right, with that, I think uh, I'll hand it back to Maggie. Awesome. And we have Andrew who's going to walk us through some of his recent work on Unity Catalog. Cool. So I'm here to talk about some updates that we made to our Unity Catalog ingestion source. Um, it's still definitely a work in progress, but we're looking to improve it. Um, and I'll have some uh, kind of questions about what you guys want at the end. Um, so first, uh, an announcement, we're going to be dropping support for Python 3.7. Uh, in the next month because uh, the it has reached its end of life. So 
If you are still on 3.7, please, please update. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, on to Unity Catalog. Um, we have a few new uh, features for it. So we now are using the new Databricks Python SDK. Um, big thanks to the, the Databricks team for this. Um, it looks like it's pretty actively updated. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. Um, Aside from that, there's an updated connection test, which I can go ahead and show you guys now. Um, here is my uh, recipe, uh, just to give you guys a little sneak peek. Um, we now allow you to uh, ingest profiling information and usage information, um, and this thing will tell you whether you can do that. Nothing too crazy. Um, as I was saying, we also increase ingest usage information from SQL warehouses. So um, this, if you run queries in your clusters, we won't be able to get that. But if you run them in SQL warehouses, which it looks like Databricks is really trying to support, um, we will pick that up. And then we pick up profiling information um, via Spark's analyze table compute statistics um, query. So I'll, I'll show you guys what that looks like. And then lastly, a few smaller improvements. Um, we we update external URLs so that, as uh, Shoshanka was saying, you can go directly to your Data Explorer links in Databricks um, from Data Hub, and we resolve server service principal names um, when we're looking at ownership. So I'll, I'll uh, demo all of these things. So first, uh, we have our Unity Catalog ingester ingestion source. Let's just run it. Um, and then I'll wait for that for a second. It should be pretty quick because I'm running against a pretty small uh, test data source. And there it goes. Um, so a lot of this isn't new, but I'll just give a quick demo. We, we pull the schema, you know, fields, types, whether it's nullable, that sort of thing. Um, we pull column level lineage information. Um, so, for example, you can see we we have this table and we create um, a second table based on it. Um, and now we also pull, or and I can go and look at the data by clicking this view in Databricks button, and that'll bring me to the page here. Um, so, for example, if we look at the sample data, this is just taken from their uh, one of their demos. We have. Uh, a few columns. Um, and if we look at the stats here, this, this will match up. Um, we now pull the min, the max, the null percent, um, and distinct counts for each column. Um, and then we'll also get table level stats like rows, number of columns, and your number of queries, who's making the queries. It's just me. Um, and then lastly, we can look at uh, which queries are run. So um, I, for example, have this query. Uh, uh, I have too many tabs open, just a moment. This query that gets run every four hours. Um, and that, that dominates the, uh, the usage here. And then we have a few other queries. So um, if you run queries in a notebook, but you point at a pro warehouse, um, as opposed to a cluster, we, we can also pick these up. Um, this is a pretty new feature. So I just ran this today and you can see we're, we're picking it up here. Um, then just to go over a few other smaller features, um, we can see this owner is this data hub test, um, service principle, uh, because before we would just show a kind of UUID, that's how Databricks stores them internally. Um, but now we will resolve the name for you. And um, yeah, I, I guess that's an overview of all the features. Um, and then lastly, um, we're always looking to improve our sources. Um, there's definitely a lot of things we can do with Databricks, um, but you know we can only build one at a time. So if you guys could give us your input on what would be the most helpful to you, that would be really great. Um, just some examples. Uh, we could get better or higher detailed profiling using great expectations rather than the analyze calls. Um, and this won't require modified privileges on tables, which is 
um, I know, uh, a little concerning. Um, and you can also, we could also try to ingest Databricks notebooks, workflows, or ML models um, as, as they have a, a managed ML flow uh, service. And we could also support multiple workspaces that point at the same meta store. If this is something that you guys do um, right now, you can only adjust one workspace at a time. So um, please let us know either in Slack or I guess here, um, what sort of improvements you'd like to see. Um, thanks. All right, thank you, Andrew. And also congrats to Andrew on your first town hall presentation, my guy. Well done. <laughs> All right, we are going to move over to our community case study. So Raj, I will hand it over to you to talk through some of the recent work y'all been doing. Meg, yeah, I'm gonna kick us off here. Awesome, um, so, hey, Bobby Jean. Yeah, um, my name is Bobby Jean. Uh, Raj and I are here today to um, showcase the joins uh, capability that we built. Um, so we're excited to be here. Um, so we are part of a larger team that's building a enterprise data catalog um, for both Optum and United Healthcare. Um, and we were hearing from our customers, you know, just the need to support cataloging and crowdsourcing of joint relationship data um, between data sets that, that um, don't have um, those relationships um, documented in the source systems, nor can those be programmatically, you know, ingested into the catalog. Um, such things like surrogate keys. Um, uh, and joins are a beneficial, like, uh, metadata uh, for our business analysts who are not necessarily data owners. Um, so as we created this join relationship within the data set, we opened up kind of the permissions um, to allow um, non-data set owners to create these relationships. Um, as you create the relationship, and Raj is going to walk through the demo, um, each join relationship is its, is its own entity. And that allows you know um, ownership enrichment um, to be um, to be added specific to that join relationship. Any documentation, um, since joins are bi uh, bi-directional, um, we created it as its own entity. Um, and currently we support joining, um, adding an individual join relationship within the UI, um, but we're also kind of in the development of um, working on a CSV emitter um, for these join relationships. So I will, um, Raj, I'll let you walk through kind of the UI functionality. Sure. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bobby Jean. Uh, I'm Raj Tekal. I'm a lead software engineer at Optum Technology. And uh, uh, of course, my regards to the open, uh, open source community and all the contributors, my regards to my team members and my leaders. And my uh, this particular demo that I'm doing, the special regards to uh, Purvi. And I know it's a place to just document. Um, we already have data sets. So we want to, we want to now have a show joins which are uh, curated uh, known, uh, known uh, uh, in information that is better, um, known joins that we can do better. So let me go and start uh, my uh, data hubs. So let's see. Let, can you guys tell, let me know if you can see my screen? You are good to go. Excellent. So uh, I know the first step is, you know, you can go and you can search. Uh, we just did a little modification in terms of how we took the open source data and thanks its contribution. And we want to contribute this back. Uh, we have an open PR uh, that is being reviewed, but in the meantime, we incorporated into our own fork and I, that's where I'm demoing. And so you'd go and like search here for, as a start, for example, I just say a quick thing, right? You select orders from something, something from orders and customers where order customer ID, so this is kind of a join. So what we said was we have a name for a join. You can put whatever, uh, whatever in like description or some kind of details of it. And which is which? Uh, which data set or table in this case is called is joining to another data set, and what fields are getting joined, right? So that's kind of what it is. So first step is we're going to go and search for my data set that I am working with. So I I go and I say, okay, I want to combine orders and uh, orders and customer, right? So I go and click order. So this is how, like Andrew already showed you, this is kind of the screen, kind of it looks. 
And yeah, this is a nice feature that Shashank said, you know, it'll tell you what kind of an owner you are in the future, I think that's great. And we added this thing called relationships. So you go and click the relationships and it says you can now add join. So it says, okay, add a join. So you click and when you click, you come into a screen like this and then say which uh, it will give a big search. It's almost like the search and you can pick where you want to join. So I started from order. So I'm going to join the customer and I say, okay. And it'll say, okay, what do you want to call this? This is like a, uh, all the order uh, for a customer, what you can name something, and I can say, okay, my order, uh, my order key from the orders is going to be, I mean, sorry, customer key from the here is equal to the customer key here. And I can add more things. I mean, I don't have to, and I can give the select statement, um, etc. I can give more details, etc. And I can cancel, do edits, add more, more this one, and I can say submit. And when I submit, uh, you can see that now in the relationships tab, we have something called a join. And it's just saying which fields are going, which field, which data sets are going to which data sets. And currently we are seeing, we could see this join from the standpoint of a customer also, if you want, or you can see it right now, we are seeing this from the order standpoint. Or like now I want to have another joints. Maybe I want to join orders to line items, for example. So I went to, I'm in orders, I clicked it. I want to go and join line items, okay. And I want to say submit. And I want to say, this is all, all the items of an order or something like that. And I can say, okay, order key and here order key. I, for the lack of better something else, I just, you know, just some kind of day. Uh, something, this is like not meaningless. I just want to show you there is, uh, uh, we can add more things and you can add more, more rows if you want, et cetera, or delete the rows if you don't want. And then you can say submit and there you bingo. So we now, this is what I added. And this was, this is like the one that I added before. Now you can look it from either side or you can go and look at the, just the join itself. So if I say, I want to look at the join, I go and click on this and I'm not say here, view the join. And it's going to show me the details of the join. This is standing alone. So I can go and add owners if I want, add tags, add some documentation, et cetera, glass items, et cetera. I can do, or I can go and uh, modify. I can go and edit. Then in which case I can add more fields or remove more fields. Or I can look at it from this data set stand, standpoint. Order. But this join itself is like from here to here. I think going forward in the future, we'll probably like, you know, have like maybe more features like deletes, maybe we'll probably have uh, maybe other types of joins. Maybe we can show it somewhere, we can do multi joins or we can automatically have a way to create a SQL statement. I want to go once in a join, I can click and say, I want a, a, I want an SQL statement from here. I want to take these field, these field, these field and can create a the statement that you can use it in your span. So that's all folks that I have that I wanted to show you. Done. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks. Thanks, Raj. I, I will just, just in closing, we are, you know, some things that we are kind of working on um, kind of post implementation. So we are, are just deploying this to our customers now. So we're excited to them for them to start using it and, and just hear, you know, what other enhancements would be needed. Um, but some things that we have um, kind of in our pipeline to further address is, is allowing the deletion of a join, um, as well as looking at um, allowing a CSV to be ingested directly through the UI um, to have that join creation as well. So those are the things that uh, we've thought of kind of as future enhancements. So thank you for having us here today. Thanks, Raj. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Abhijin you. Thank you, and Raj. Abhijin and everybody. Yeah. Thanks, folks. It's been awesome to work with the Optum team. Um, this is, yeah, it's just been like a true joy to, to work with you guys. So really, really appreciate the hard work here. All right. We are going to move on to our column level lineage, kind of deep dive. Um, we had Hajin from our DevRel team pre-record a session. Um, she's based out of South Korea, so hopefully she is tucked into bed and not thinking about data hub right now, but we have a 
uh, recording from her. One second. Um, and also, uh, Herschel and Andrew, there's a question in chat around um, uh, Snowflake lineage, if you could take a look at that. Um, all right. Can we see that? You guys are good? Hi, how are you? Um, I'm Hyejun Yoon from the DevRel team in Acryl. Um, today, I'm going to introduce you about the columnar lineage and how to get them into GitHub. So what we'll cover today is a quick recap on what is column level lineage and three different ways to get the column level lineage into data hub. And I'm also going to show you a quick demo of the each method. So what is column level lineage? It's basically a data lineage at the column level. So it helps the data users to understand how columns get depend on each other or how a certain column is calculated or aggregated. So check out the live demo at the last September 22 town hall. Um, Gabe and Chris will explain um, them beautifully. Okay, so there are three ways to get the column level lineage into Data Hub. Um, automatic extraction and Data Hub API and file-based lineage. So a quick disclaimer, um, to create the column level lineage, um, the target data entity must be exist in the data instance itself. And at the moment, we don't support the column level lineage manipulation via GraphQL or UI. Okay. So first we have a automatic extraction. So we support um, the automatic column level lineage extraction for um, these, these data sources, Snowflake, Data Bricks United, Looker, and Tableau. For these sources, the CLL extraction is enabled by default. So you don't have to um, do much about it. Um, just run the um, ingestion. Um, like a normal way, like data hub and just um, recipe.yaml, and it'll extract the CLL um, automatically. So uh, the next thing is data hub API. So if you want to define a custom CLL, or if you're using um, um, a data source that does not support the automatic extraction, that this would be a great way to um, get the CLL into Data Hub. Okay. So it works under um, Acro Data Hub itself, and mainly we're using um, metadata change proposal wrapper here. So it's very straightforward. Um, all you have to do is just um, create the fine grained lineage using the fine grained lineage class. Um, just specify the upstreams and downstreams here, and wrap that wrap them um, with the MCP wrapper and emit the event to the um, data of GMS. Okay, let's, let me show you how to do that really quick. Um, I already deployed my um, data instance in uh, um, locally. So um, at the moment, I don't have any lineage or column level lineage here with this table. But um, with this Python script, I'm going to create a very simple column level lineage that goes from um, fact users created to fact users deleted. So after defining the fine grade lineage, I'm going to emit the event here. Okay, just let me run this. And you refresh that, you can see the beautiful column level lineage here. And um, the other way you could see the column level lineage is go to the data entity page and click lineage tab and click column lineage and select a column that has um, the related lineage. And if you click here, you could see the whole column path from the upstream to the downstream. 
Okay. And the next thing is file based on local lineage. So um, I think Python SDK has um, a great flexibility, um, but um, I think file based column level lineage is much more simpler and straightforward. So because it lets you define the custom CLL in YAML file. So you do have to install um, this data hub lineage file plugin before um, using this. And it should be like much more like a normal ingestion. Um, instead, you have to specify the um, path to the lineage file under config under file. So this is a very simplified version of the file based lineage.yaml. So all you have to do is um, define entity and target entity and the upstreams and downstream entity. And under fine grain lineage, um, just like Python SDK, you could just define the upstreams and downstreams um, by specifying the schema field path. Okay, let me show you how to do this. Before that, I'm just going to delete um, the existing lineages here. Like this. And yeah, just make sure that we don't have anything um, before. Okay, so here is the recipe for the file-based lineage. Um, note that I already specified my um, the path to the lineage file here, and um, this is what the lineage file looks like. So under fine grained lineages, I already specified the um, path to the certain columns here. Yep. So what I'm going to do is. Um, just run the native ingest recipe.yaml. Okay, so from the logs, we could see um, it created the, we, it produced one event um, and like regarding the upstream lineage. So if I refresh the um, UI here, you could see the same lineage was created. Okay, so here is a quick comparison of the Python SDK and file based lineage. And I think um, both method has its own pros and cons. And I'm hoping that this session was helpful to understand um, the different method to get the column level lineage to data hub. Okay, thank you for listening. See you later. Bye. All right, column level lineage palooza is, is the, it's the theme for today. Um, so awesome job, hey Jen. Uh, appreciate you putting in the effort there. And um, I think Herschel, we're gonna pass it over to you to talk through uh, SQL parsing. Yes, let me share my screen. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about SQL parsing. Initially, this will be, it's it's kind of two pieces. There's like a core SQL parsing framework, and then also an integration with BigQuery specifically. Um, but both will have tools and extensibility in the future. But before we get started with that, why do we care about lineage? I think Hagen touched on this broadly, but lineage really ties the metadata graph together. It's what enables you to actually make heads or tails of, you know, the complexity and, and the, you know, often huge numbers of tables and data sets that you have. Specifically, it powers the impact analysis so you can see, hey, if I change this column, who do I impact downstream? You can do things like build propagation flows. So, you know, if one table has like a sensitive tag on it, 
and there's a downstream, maybe you propagate that sensitive tag to the downstream as well. And then you can also power things like alerting and incidents. Um, column level lineage makes all of these things more powerful. You can say, not only at the table level, who do I impact, but actually if I change this specific column, what does that do in my ecosystem? Is that safe or not? Same with propagation and alerting. So how do we get lineage? Um, with Without any SQL parsing, there's only a few systems that we can extract lineage from. You know, like for example, Snowflake or Looker are fairly well modeled and have some of this information available. But I think in the vast majority of cases, you're writing SQL and it's pretty tough to get lineage out of them, uh, out of that SQL. Uh, Data Hub already does a pretty good job with table level lineage, but um, you know, it still has some rough edges. Its accuracy isn't as high as we would like it to be. Um, often the column, column information, if we can get it at all, um, can be incomplete or ambiguous. And then work, making that work across, you know, the numerous SQL dialects is extremely difficult. And so often you'll, you'll see like existing SQL parsers will just like for own exception, if you pass in something that's a little too, you know, Snowflake specific or BigQuery specific. And so really the solution here is to build something that is cross dialect and schema aware. Why do we care about schema awareness? Um, really that's just because SQL would be ambiguous without it. Um, and so, I realized I'm not full screen here. Um, I don't know if you guys can still see this, but the, re the reason we care about this ambiguity is that, you know, let's just look at this simple example. You're, you know, selecting from table one and you're joining table two on, you know, column A exists in both, great. But if I looked at the SQL, I could not tell you which table column B came from. And so you can't actually generate correct lineage or column level lineage from, from the SQL without actually having additional information. And so that's why we need to be schema aware. And you can imagine that in more complex SQL, this kind of stuff happens all the time. And so maybe you can guess it in a couple of cases, but in the complex ones, guessing is going to be probably worse than not having anything at all because you really do rely on the correctness of these things. Great. So with that in mind, we built a SQL parser. Uh, you know, there's only already like four or five open source SQL parsers. This is, you know, number six. Um, we built it on top of the SQL Glot library the SQL Glot library is a SQL parser and transpiler that you know works across 19 different SQL dialects. And you know, for the for the rough edges where it doesn't, I like actually, you know, submitted some PRs and um, or submitted some issues and helped get those go, those things resolved. So I think like the the cross dialect support is pretty robust, and um, that way we can we can have this base layer that actually works across all of these things. And the data hub parser talks to your live data hub instance to get schema information, and so that way it has all of the context that it needs to resolve things correctly. And what is it output? So this is just an example, like create view. This is actually an Oracle SQL statement. Um, and you know, on the on the right, you can see what we extract out of it. And there's more columns that got truncated off here. Um, but you know, it's a create query. You can see the input and output tables, as well as for each column in the downstream, so the department, and then the employee and salary you'll see the list of upstreams that it came from. 
And so in this case, like the salary you would see, um, it came from both of these two fields. And so it would track that it, it comes from both, um, or it comes from both like num and count or something along those lines. Um, all right, so let's do a quick demo of what that looks like. And let me, let me just stop my share and reshare my full screen. Okay, so I have a quick demo SQL here. This is you know pretty simple as far as SQL goes, but enough to show a little bit of complexity. Thank you, Maggie, for uh, writing this the SQL initially. Um, and if we go into this, we have a new like little CLI tool that just makes it easy to test these things out. But you can say data hub check SQL lineage. And um, you know, put in like in this case, the query was run in this database and in this schema. So, you know, in Snowflake, you can select like the active database and schema. So we take those into account. Um, and then you just pass in the, the SQL from this thing. And if we run that, we will see a full summary of all of this. And so we can see that it's a select statement. Um, we can see, for example, that the average purchase amount came from two different columns and it tracks it through the common table expression here. And then for our active customers, it does a similar thing. It tracks it through the common table expression and extracts out the actual upstream table that you depended on here, not the CTV. Um, so that's just the CLI tool for this. There's a corresponding piece in the code that you can use and then um, you can you can convert these into actual metadata that the data hub system will then like consume very straightforward in a straightforward manner. All right. So I've got to run through a few more of the caveats here. So what does it do well? A lot of things. There's a lot of edge cases with SQL. This is, you know, kind of a uh like you can get stuck in the hole of handling all of the edge cases in SQL. Broadly, these are the things that we try to do well. I think like any subqueries, any CTEs, unions, um, things like that. So as far as statement types. And then, you know, if you're using different functions, you're aliasing your columns, you're using case statements to have conditional logic, all of these things will, will get handled as you would expect. You know, the case statements will merge the lineage together for common table expressions, we'll track it up to the, the things that the common table expression depended on and so forth. And then there's the other edge cases around casing and quoting um, around normalizing table names, things like that. You know, some fun fun things that we discovered as, as we were doing this. The, this from A versus from A quoted A means different things on different systems. You know, so for example, for most SQL systems, these two are different. These are referring to different tables. But on Snowflake and BigQuery, they actually refer to the, the same table, but for different reasons. Um, and, you know, we handle a lot of these edge cases for you, so you don't have to think about it. And then for struct subfields, uh, if you're using that, we extract them in a best effort way. If we can't extract it, like the exact subfield that you're depending on, we'll fall back and declare the lineage on the overall struct column. Um, what do we not do well? So merge statements, we don't support column level lineage for them. Table level lineage will continue to work fine. Um, there's a couple more esoteric things 
you know, um, Snowflake has a select multi-table insert where you can insert into multiple tables in one query. We don't support that well. Um, similarly, Redshift has a select into that is actually an insert. Um, I think the one big thing that I think people probably use that we don't do well is on nest, if you have nested arrays, uh, we don't track the lineage of those properly. Everything else will, like all of the other lineage will work. It's just the unnest. Um, the things that were in the unnest won't get tracked. And then finally, if you're using like generating temp tables and then selecting from the temp tables to generate your final one, we don't do the multi statement tracking properly. Um, that's still a work in progress. Bunch of other, other things here that on both slides that I'll kind of gloss over. I think the interesting piece is how well does this actually do? So we've been testing this with some of the customers here at Acryl for some of our customers here at Acryl for a while. So specifically, we tested um, a corpus of 3,000 BigQuery select statements and then a corpus of 800 BigQuery create table as select statements. Table level lineage, 99% of these, we are getting them correct. Um, and, you know, working on that final 20 basis points or whatever, but um, it is far better than any existing open source parsers will do. And then the other piece is for column level lineage, for the select statements, we generated column lineage for about 85% of those queries. Um, and the majority of the cases where we said no column lineage was available were queries that were like select count star from this table, because those don't actually have any column lineage, right? They only depend at, on the table at a, at a table level. Um, and so a lot of these were actually correctly classified as no column lineage. Um, the create table as test, I think is a better reflection of that. So, you know, very rarely do you create a table that's just like select count star from another thing. Uh, it'd be a little sad one cell table. Um, and so because that happens less frequently, I think the corpus of create table as select statements is probably more accurate for what you would actually care about. And on that one, we're at just over 99% of coverage. Um, so some caveats I call out at the bottom, you know, I was iteratively developing the SQL parser, testing on this corpus. It's like, you know, training on your test data in the ML world. Um, so your results will probably be a little bit worse, but probably not by too much. And, you know, we're definitely open to chatting if, if you run into edge cases. So how do you get your hands on this? The core of this logic is up in a PR. It's in draft right now. That includes the little CLI tool that I demoed, the check SQL lineage tool. And then also it adds a new helper method on the data hub graph. For those who don't know, the data hub graph is kind of the main entry point of the Python SDK for interacting with all things data hub. It lets you, you know, get metadata, you know, push, push lineage, push other information, run deletes, you know, list earns, apply to like conduct searches, think all sorts of things. We have documentation on it on the on the website. We definitely recommend checking that out if you haven't. There's a new method there that you pass in SQL and you know a couple of those other details, and we give you back what that SQL is doing. And so the idea is for anyone who's using um, who's using a lot of these systems where you don't have SQL parsing out of the box or you know out of the box support for lineage, you can, if you have your, your SQL available from some other system, you can just pass it in and then send that lineage up to data hub. 
And so if you're doing you know, different things in Airflow or you're using you know, a tool like Postgres or uh, Oracle, which may not have like a you know, query history tab that we can, we can pull from, you can push that stuff in using our SDK. And then the goal is to integrate this into our existing ingestion sources. BigQuery will be the first one uh, early next week. And then we're planning on doing, doing similar stuff for a lot of the other sources. So definitely would love to get some, some feedback and, you know, SQL goes crazy. So send us your crazy SQLs and we'll see if we can, uh, we can parse them correctly. Uh, with that, thanks. I think very excited to, uh, um, you know, have people get their hands on this and uh, see what see what we can do with it. Yeah, I think Shoshanka just nailed it. Like we just low key announced a highly effective SQL parser. Like no big deal, just another day in the life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right, um, we are getting close on time, but Indy, um, I would love to have you walk us through your work. So folks, um, if you do need to drop, we understand that of course, and we always post our full recording on YouTube within about 24 hours of the session. Um, but so, so if you need to drop, we understand, we won't take it uh, personally, but Indy, I will hand it over to you to talk to some of the uh, new endpoints you built out. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll try to be quick here um, since I know we're at time. So let me share my screen. Um, okay, so all right, can you see uh, Data Hub? <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, my name is Indy. I'm on the platform team here at Acrel. And so uh, today I'm going to show you some features we've been working on related to managing time series indices. Um, specifically time series aspects. Um, so what is a time series aspect? Um, here is an example from the real life data hub. So when I search for sample, I'm seeing like all of the results here. Um, these are regular old entity aspects, um, but there's a time page, do you see it? It's this one, the number of queries in the last month. Um, so this is data that we've, uh, you know, that we ingest over time and store with a timestamp related to it. Um, and, you know, in this case, in this demo, the tables are really popping off. People are loving these data sets. Um, but we're only showing the number of queries in the last month. Um, and that's that's great, really cool information. Um, but we could have been ingesting this data for years. Um, in this case, for the purposes of this demo, um, I ingested a usage stat every hour uh, for a year for these three data sets. And so, however, only uh, the last month is being shown on the UI. So not only can this create a very large index, but also it can actually affect search performance. So in this case, since there's so few results, it's probably not going to make a big difference. Um, but in, you know, cases where many results are coming back, which is you know, probably the case for your data hub deployment more than uh, the quick start sample data, then querying this large index can uh, cause a performance issue. And so uh, here we're going to show you some tools to manage your storage space as well as improve the performance um, related to time series indices. So let's say your Elasticsearch cluster is getting really big. One, you probably don't want to just like delete some of your entities. And, uh, you know, they would be totally gone and your catalog wouldn't be completed anymore. So what's the point of that? Um, but if you are having, in for this example, a year's worth of time series data and only 30 days worth is being shown on the UI, deleting older data probably isn't going to affect the system as much and it can save a lot of space. Um, so the first thing that you may want to do is uh, identify where the opportunity is. So with this new endpoint, um, get Time, get index sizes. Um, it's under the new and shiny operations namespace where more uh, operation related tooling will be coming soon. Uh, but here in this case, so these are all the time series indices we have. So, you know, a lot of them are pretty small, but if we check out the data set usage statistics, it's five gigabytes. Um, now this is just for three indices and uh, you're, you're, you probably have way more entities than that. 
um, and it's by far the largest. So let's say I don't want to be storing five gigabytes of data anymore. Um, I can use the new endpoint to check out um, how, what are some opportunities to optimize it? Um, so we've got this new one called truncate time series aspect also under the operations. Um, and this one's going to take in a few parameters. So from the out previous output, we saw the data set and data set usage statistics as the entity name and the aspect name um, to input here. The end time in milliseconds um, is one that I looked up, which is about five weeks ago. Um, we can tune parameters such as batch size and the timeout, should we so choose. And uh, critically, we support a, a dry run flag. It's on by default, so you're not going to accidentally delete any data um, unless you like really want to. So what this endpoint will show us, oh no, where is it? Missing URL. Uh, my copying and pasting failed. Uh, okay. I did this earlier, so let's just find the old query. Uh, okay. So in this case, uh, it would, it shows me that I have 53,000 rows in this table and I would delete 48,000 of them, which is 90%. So over 90% of the data that we're storing in this five gigabyte table is not even being used on the UI. And so this is a great opportunity to clean it up. So um, it shows that this was a dry run and we can run with the dry run equals false to actually execute it. So I'm gonna take the working query and change dry run to false. Um, and what this is gonna give me is a task ID in Elasticsearch. Um, so it's running and we can check the status of it using, you guessed it, another endpoint. So I'm not gonna uh, use what I copied and pasted here. Um, so this one is called, is also under operations called get ES task status. Uh, Cause you know, maybe we'll have the other tasks in the future but for now, this is specifically for Elasticsearch. Um, so we're gonna give it the task ID we just got. And, oh no. Uh, Sorry. Okay. We love a live demo, Wendy. You got this, girl. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. All right. Let's see if this works. No. Okay. Uh oh, you know what? It's because the node name has a has a dash in it, which I didn't think was possible. So I'm gonna have to update that regex. But anyway, um, what this would tell you is that the um the task is done because it doesn't take very long. So uh, I will update that. And then when I run the uh, same command again to see you know, what would happen if we were to delete the old data, then you know, now we, we see that there's only 5,000 rows in the table. Um, only 10% of them are you know, older than that amount. And so we would still have the very same data available in Data Hub, but the size of our index is now about 10% you know, of what it was before. So you can use these new endpoints to manage the size of your time series indices, um, which not only saves you space in Elasticsearch, but can also improve search performance. Um, so this feature will be available in this week's release. And there will be docs on the Data Hub docs website under the RESTly API. So right now, restore indices is the um, operational related endpoint we provide here. And there's a bunch more about to drop this week. So you'll be able to find out how to use them here. Um, and yeah, so in the future of this feature, uh, we're implementing some performance improvements for the query, um, even if you don't tr uh, truncate the index. So hopefully it'll run faster without you having to lift a finger. Um, and for this endpoint, we would like to support like semantic time instead of a timestamp that you have to Google like epoch converter. Um, we also want to implement an optimization that if you're for example, in this case, trimming 90% of the data, instead of just deleting from the uh, from the existing index, we can actually create a new index and just copy over the data still being used since it's a smaller portion that can uh, finish faster. And 
uh, it would be cool to be able to automatically apply a policy that would uh, keep the data tr trimmed and in shape automatically um, and eventually add more operational endpoints for you to manage your instance. So look forward to those. And uh, thank you so much. Appreciate your patience with the uh, with the live demo. We love a live demo. Also, Indy just gave us a, uh, we didn't even call it out, but a, a sneak peek or a, a preview of the unified search and browse experience. So yes. to see that as yes. well, that'll be included in, in the release. All right, this is awesome. Um, thank you so much, Indy. Also, Indy's first presentation at Town Hall, a nice and wonderful debut. Fantastic job, guys. Um, Thank you folks for your time and your attention. We appreciate you very, very much. And we could stick around for a couple minutes if there's any other questions, um, but otherwise, thanks for your time and we'll see you on Slack, guys.